Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Welcome back to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge, Rosie Burkett and me, Orlando Murrin. Today we're going to be talking about how to use up fruit and veg, especially those you've grown yourself. Now, um, I know that our listeners would like some practical help for their garden problems. So <laughs> I'd love some oh, ideas. Hold on a minute. <laughs> I, I'm the, I, cooking stuff, yeah, gardening. No. That's no. not my thing. I, how, to, how, to blow up pu- how to blow up a puddling <laughs> pool and fill it up. That's fine in the garden. How to pick, fix the swing. Yeah, I can do that. Also, how to tidy up dog mess. I'm very good at that. Anything else in the garden? No idea. Tom, I, by gardening problems i mean having too much of them so please can you help us both of you please can you help us with tomatoes seem to be a terrible problem for people any ideas for tomatoes what how to use them Mm, yeah Uh, gazpacho is like a a real good one to make blend it into a soup is fantastic or cook it down and make an amazing kind of like passata tomato sauce very very simple but that way you can you've got it cooked out and you can freeze it in batches mm. and it's just you need to bring it down in size completely. so do you sim- simmer it away to get the wa- drive the water off yeah cut the tomatoes in half basically like so throw in some chopped onions cut that down sweat it down with some garlic and then cut all the tomatoes in half throw them in a little bit of tomato puree some vinegar some sugar um and a, a, a maybe a crumbly like beef stock cube one of those and then just cook it out for ages and ages and ages and it comes down and then you can puree it if you like or you can just keep it chunky as it is but that then uses a base for pasta sauces use it thicken in it but put it in into stews doing whatever it is that way you've got it cooked out you can bag it up a little freezer bag to stick it in the freezer freeze it in quite small bags so that you just pull out one at a time yeah. fantastic great ideas now courgettes these are a bit of a nightmare for people as you've said they kind of crop up all over the place and they get bigger overnight. So um, it's no good just, you know, using one. We need quite industrial solutions for these. Now, we've got a great uh, recipe on the website for a way of griddling them, which um, will uh, involve uh, disposing of a lot of courgettes on the griddle and they shrink up on the griddle. So you can start off with quite a lot and they get smaller. Um, Any ideas for other ideas for courgettes? Well, one one of the things is similar to to the griddling, but if you um again harking back to Sicily because obviously they have amazing courgettes, um I went to a sandwich shop where they this famous famous sandwich shop called B- Borderi in Ortigia Market where they make the most epic sandwiches. Sicilian sandwiches are things of beauty, and um so he'd he'd make this huge sandwich and he'd fill it with like incredible buffalo mozzarella amazing prosciutto um tomatoes and then he got these these marinated courgettes that had been marinated and they were all they were covered in olive oil and so if you griddle courgettes if you if you griddle them dr- quite dry and then toss them in a marinade of say like crushed garlic thyme lemon juice lemon zest and um just do a load of them cover them in that and then keep them in the fridge and then use them in sandwiches or salads like pasta they'd be nice in like kind of orzo salad or lovely yeah. So it's so, delicious doesn't it i mean that's like, that's like that's like the dream oh, no, they do make very good chutney so it's the sort of thing you could do. You can like do a really good chutney with them, cook them like and like you would make any other chutney. That base of sugar and vinegar cooked out with onions and, and diced up courgettes cooked out. They're, they're, and they keep for ages. They're lovely. And they use good quite a good quantity of them as well. Oh yeah, yeah it's a yeah. great way of using them up. It's a yeah. great way of using them up because it's such a shame to waste them, isn't it? Yeah, you don't want to waste courgettes. Oh, don't Speaking. and eat them. Eat them raw. They're so delicious raw. So just either very finely slice them or on a mandolin. Um, and then they've got this amazing nutty flavour, a pinch of salt. So they give, they sort of dress themselves in their own juices, lemon juice, olive oil, shaved parmesan, basil, um, and then artichoke hearts from a jar ripped up and tossed through there. And then some like crunchy pine nuts or, or sunflower seeds or whatever. Wonderful. You remind me of a, a video that I saw yesterday of uh, an amazing sandwich they're doing in New Jersey at the moment, which is a gigantic pickle 
halved. <laughs> then you put all your ham and cheese in the middle of it, of the pickle. Oh, wow. And then you eat. The, so the pickle is the sandwich. That takes That's the place of idea. the bread. Uh, yeah, good for a carb-free diet. Right. There you go. And get, yeah, who doesn't want that? That sounds right. Also, who doesn't want to eat a giant pickle sandwich? That sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. The only thing well, that sounds like you could improve that is deep frying it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In batter? Yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, now, any ideas for runner beans? We've got a great recipe on the website for uh, runner beans with charred leeks and vinaigrette. Yeah, it's yours, vinaigrette, Rosie. Yeah. Um, any other things for, for, for runner beans, or do we just need to eat them, eat them, eat them while we've got them? I actually think they're quite nice um, if they're if they're young and if they don't have those fibrous um, kind of strings. String, stringy you, bits. You can always so, take that off, but it's a bit fig, fiddly. But when they're young, very very finely slice them, um, just. Uh, you know, across ways. So into into little, t- if you finally, finally slice them, they're really nice and crunchy. Nice with, say, red onions, sumac, salt, um, olive oil, lemon juice. They, they, they are lovely. They've got such an amazing natural sweetness to them that they're, they're so beautiful and they're clean and crisp and fresh. They go really well with something like harissa or chili. So that kind of counterbalance of the two things together are amazing. And nut oils, they go really well with walnut oil, even a, a little drizzle of sesame oil, those sort of things, those those nutty, they're, they're really good for counterbalance big flavours. So they're, they're delicious like that. They're, they're stunning. And do you serve them in the restaurant in that way? Where, no, not in that way. No, that's something I would do at home. They're, right. they're, we would use them quite often they'll be used as just as a very simple side garnish just in salted butter that's it but mm. but just when you want to create something a little bit more for home those counterbalance of flavors they work so well. tahini paste yes they'd be tahini. lovely with tahini yeah. tahini paste is lovely because they need to be eaten quite fast don't they run the beans they're one of those things that gets a bit stale like broad beans get stale exactly quite fast, as soon as they're they? picked the natural sugars turn to starch yeah. and they start beginning to get a little bit boring and bland that's why you want you want to pick them cut them, cook them straight away, serve it like peas, you know, yeah. that beautiful yeah. sweetness that you want. And sweet corn's another one where it, it just, the graph collapses of the sugars in the sweet corn as soon as it's been picked. So sometime we must do a podcast on sweet corn. Ooh, I think that would be yes. a fantastically exciting subject. Um, lettuces are a bit of a problem because you tend to plant a row of lettuces so you get lots of lettuces all at once do you cook with lettuces tom or do you yes 100 percent. what do you great, do with them great baby gem lettuces are fantastic char grilled mm. they're, they're absolutely stunning they're wonderful or sliced down things like romaine lettuce very very thinly sliced stirred into peas i mean peas bacon uh, pace of la francaise I mean, yeah it's a that's classic. a famous but, ba- it, but lettuce that even just stirred into pasta dishes just sliced Slice, slice and stirred right through at the end. Absolutely amazing way of bulking things out, but giving a clean crispness of flavour, using them up, uh, really good. Cook with lettuce, definitely. I mean, it's got to be the right sort of things like oak leaf or lola rosso or endive or things like that. They're not good, but the, things like um, things like chicories are fantastic for that. You, you know, radicchio, those big, strong, hearty flavours, they're really good with Italian dishes. That that kind of, that, that kick of a, a kind of acidity and iron and everything that you get, that bitterness that you can get from those lettuces of... I I think it's really underused lettuce generally because it has that that kind of juicy crunch to it, which is mm. really enjoyable. But also, it has flavour. Yes. It has a really interesting flavour. Well, those irony and leaves. bitter ones are so good with things like yeah. shellfish. They're great with cockles and clams and mussels mm. and very very simple things. And like that. You know, I'd even like to put in a word for the good old iceberg occasionally because it's so refreshing that it's almost like having a fizzy drink and mouthful of iceberg. I love in an the iceberg right, in the right place with fried chicken. In, in a, you know, if you're doing a fried chicken um, bun, iceberg, it's got to be iceberg. People it's are so, so mean about and iceberg. Fresh. And prawn cocktail, it's got to yes, be iceberg, hasn't yeah. it? But people, well, in this room, icebergs are welcome, aren't uh, they? Icebergs are welcome. I think, again, that, that, that harks back to conversations we've had before about childhood memories. And it was the lettuce that everyone used to have as a kid. And it, it, I mean, I love it. An iceberg is great. You know, you just don't want to have it with fish paste like I had as a child. <laughs> Put the two together, that's not great. Fish paste and meat paste. Yeah, Too no. many sandwiches like that in my lunchbox. <laughs> yeah, not great. Um, and what about freezing? Do you, do you, are you a good fr- home freezer, Rosie? Do you... I have frozen broad beans um, and peas when I've had too many, and I think they freeze really well. Again, if you if you 
freeze them after picking them, soon after picking them, if you know you're going to have too many. Do you, do you um, uh, blanch them first? No, just I would. I would in, in the, whack them in the freezer. Yeah, I would yeah. just, um, po- if it was broad beans, I would take them out of the pods and freeze them. Um, and then the same with peas, I would take them, pod them and freeze them. I know a gardener who said to me that she, who has a tremendous problem of, of gluts r- running right through to Christmas. That I sounds think. painful. <laughs> and she's, she um, swears by her dehydrator. So she's got a great big dehydration plant. Probably, I mentioned it humming away morning, noon and night. And she puts these things in on trays and they kind of disappear. And then she takes them out. And she, I, I don't know quite, history doesn't relate what she does with them at the other end. But you would probably turn those into a restaurant dust, wouldn't you, Tom? Are well, you a dust man? No, so, well, some things, but uh, mushrooms, yes. But most things, when they go through the dehydrator, it's about intensifying flavour. It's the same as like grapes and raisins. Do you know what I mean? That mm. what happens is you take one product that's prime, then, and then if you've got too much of it, the point of turning it into raisins is a preserving process. It's the same thing when it comes to dehydration. And what it does is it crisps things up, it intensifies flavour, and it makes things delicious. Like, and they're good for garnishing things, throwing stuff through salads, adding bits and bobs texture and crunch as well so yeah dehydrators are they're a great thing to have but like rosie touched on earlier about the tomatoes you haven't got to have a dehydrator you can just have the oven on low you yeah. know it hasn't got the airflow quite the same but just that drying process but we would with your oven rosie we were trying to make the tomatoes kind of chewy and drier whereas this dehydrator gets all that it, it does turn them you to just leave to, them to, in dust. longer does it just leave them in longer yeah yeah so it's how long you keep them uh in the oven will will um the dehydrators all have a fan and an airflow thing that's going on, but essentially you can do the same. If you had it in a low fan oven, you, yeah. you could do the and same thing. And then would you would you powder them in a because you don't want like chunks of dehydrated tomato? You would you powder them or no? Do you, nah, chunks chop them you, up. Yeah. Chunk, just chop them up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like little kind of you know like little sun dried tomatoes essentially. Yeah. You've got to go a long way to make a tomato and super dry. You'd have to slice it very thinly and, and dry it all out. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I get the point. It's a preserving thing, you know, And it's, and it's but you could take it out, stick them into olive oil, all of those sort of flavours. They, they, yeah, they, once, they're, once they're dehydrated, the, the intensity of the flavour, you can infuse them with oil and then you get the flavoured oil mm. rather than just using the product. So, you know, there's loads of things you can do, but when you've got too much of a product, if you've been growing things, yeah. Um, th- the problem that I remember when I had a restaurant was that I was very busy, you know, cooking dinner that night and suddenly something arrived that needed dealing with. So do you deputise some of your staff to, to deal with the, you know, this vat of gooseberries uh, have arrived, Tom? Yeah, or how I, do, how I mean, do you, when you were in a pre- restaurant, how many staff did you have? How many in the kitchen? Me. Yeah. <laughs> Hand of flowers is slightly different. We've got 22. So, so it's kind of like there's 22 chefs. So at some point somewhere, there's always someone doing something rather than just service. So, yeah, we've grown from a point of being very simple to being you know there's always process that goes through it not it, yeah it, people have prep jobs going on all the time yeah and that's the beauty of a restaurant isn't it that you can constantly stay on top of stuff because i do find at home sometimes you know and i hate wasting food but it is work to keep on top of all of the food sometimes is, yeah that, that's and- where a home cook you have to enjoy doing it it becomes yeah. a, an amazing hobby yeah because in the restaurant you you can constantly just be creative with someone can be doing that someone can be just just dealing with the excess you know produce or whatever and if we talk about fruit um however well organized your fruit garden is so that you get like the fruit coming in at stages it always seems to be the hottest day of the year that you're stuck there having to make jam isn't it <laughs> with you know m- bubbling vats of jam or waiting to be put into warmed jam jars and you'd rather be out on the beach, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's, it's tough for a fruit grower, I think, isn't it? I, I can't speak from experience on that one because I've as yet to have uh, enough success with, with you growing You haven't got fruit. raspberry canes and strawberries no, this year? No, we haven't had, we had a handful of strawberries, like maybe a couple of handfuls, but definitely not not a glut. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with with well, potentially, if you're making jams, you could freeze the fruit. Yeah. If you're going to cook it down anyway, um, then you could probably freeze it to get it and then save it for a for a cooler day and then make the jam later on. There, there is a book out called, I think, Five Seasons of Jam by Lily O'Brien, which, is yeah. a, the, which says that you can make a preserve every single day of the year. So I wonder if that's what 
she does. Yeah, she all her jams are so she's incredible. She has a shop on the Chatsworth Road, um, and she makes really Ch- the Chatsworth, Chatsworth Road, Road in is... East London. Yeah, it's in sort of near Clapton, Homerton, and she makes all these incredible seasonal um, jams. So she'll do like bay and blackberry or rhubarb and vanilla, um, and she's always using more than one flavor in her jam. So it's it's very driven by the seasonal fruit, um, and she uses less sugar as well. So they're very fruit fruit based um, and less so the flavors of the fruits really coming through but then she'll use some kind of other seasonal or interesting ingredient with them and she's really brilliant. and she sells them from and she sells from them hit, from, from the hit, shop but she also shop. supplies a lot of restaurants I think she supplies Claire Patak at Violet Bakery and um, so she was a pastry chef at St John um, before she started branching out and making jam but yeah her jams are so so inspiring and delicious you know sometimes they put a flavoring into jam like strawberry and violet or something like that mm. and and you think oh that sounds great but you taste it and it's still strawberry jam and you can't really you really don't notice the other thing they've put in it it must be she must have a lot of skill if she if you can actually taste the other things she's yeah. put in without it wrecking it because you wouldn't actually want a great dose of violets in your strawberry jam would you like the hardest thing with jams is the sugar content because you need the sugar content to prov- provide the preservative agent so you want the jam to last all year round you know it's, it's making something you know jams have evolved because you go you make something when the crop is ripe now but that will get you through the winter time so but it's the sugar that is the preserving agent that makes sure that it has the longevity mm. the problem with that is that sugar masks so many flavors so when you want to add something yeah. to it you always have to try and find something that can shine through with sweetness yeah, you know, that's the difficulty that so, then doesn't upset the balance of the jam setting you know it could you could do it with i don't know a flavored vinegar or something something that you think is an acidity breaker but lemon or whatever however by the time that it's set and cut through it'll either alter the jam constant how it sits or how it's texturally works but also flavor wise is very jam making especially advanced jam making is actually quite a difficult it's such thing an to art, do. But I, it is yeah i do think there's also something to be said for making kind of fresher compote style jams yes. so like the exact problem that you're talking about is the fact that you do need all that sugar in order to preserve it all year round but i sometimes make quite loose jams with with less sugar still enough sugar um to make them a nice texture but they might not preserve for for longer than a couple of weeks but you're going to eat them because you're making small batches so you're making a couple of jars and also the nice thing of doing it in a compote style is the fact that you can actually freeze them down you're not making something that's just set as a gelatin as a jelly content. yeah you get as a jelly you're actually making something that is more of a, a like of a dressing or a puree that you can then freeze down and then just defrost and gently warm back up so yeah so yeah that's a nice way of doing it and getting those extra flavors in yeah. yeah, I did an apricot and ginger one like that, which was very successful because it was it was thinner than, you know, your classic gleaming jam, but it was still thick enough to enjoy on, on a bit of bread. Was it fr- fresh apricots? Yeah, fresh apricots. Lovely. Yeah. When I was in France, where you, fresh apricots fall down at you if you oh. walk along the road, don't they? All those mad French fruits, they really do have um, amazing soft fruits there. Really wonderful. And the cherries falling, raining down wherever you look. Kent cherries are very good, though, I have to say. I think they are. I had, some, I had some this year, and I thought they were spectacular. Um, the only downside with cherries, you know the worst thing about them? The season is just so short. So short. It's just ridiculous. Something so amazing, so lush, it's just so, so short. And then when you buy the ones in the supermarket, they always look amazing and they just taste of nothing. They're very shiny, it's, aren't they? They, and look, they, they look like they, they should be incredible yeah, when you eat them. Yeah. They're just, it's so depressing because you go, oh, they taste nothing, nowhere near as good as they look. The um, best things are the are the little stalls at the side of the road. Like when I'm driving through Kent and there's and there's a sign saying local cherries, always take a detour. And just I just fill up at the you know at the greengrocer brown paper bags full of cherries they're such a pain to pick cherries i think they ought to be charged at about a pound each because they're they're a nightmare to get at they're all up a tree for heaven's sake you're up a ladder trying to get the things off they uh you know, they're very um challenging fruit i think do you know we ought to have something to eat at this point Ooh, yes but we're going to carry on because we're going to talk about chutneys and pickles and pick lily and things like that mm. but i don't know about you i'm peckish let's um we've got some griddled courgettes and we've got some Runner beans with charred leeks. Oh, lovely. Yum, yum. Thank you. Excellent. That's Jack bringing that, noisily bringing it in there. And we like the noise of the food being unwrapped as well, don't we? We like the crinkling of foil best of all. I'm not sure the listeners are going to like the chewing noises, though, (laughs) because that can be quite... 
quite off-putting. Well, I, don't, I think they're probably quite used to chewing noises on this podcast, Rosie. Um, it's not like the arches where they do kissing noises. Now, that really is offensive. It really is. And all that we, we, huffing in and out of the room. And we're, not gonna, we're certainly not going to run to kissing noises on this podcast, are we? <laughs> <laughs> that silenced everyone, hasn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. I was just much. trying to think who might kiss who. <laughs> Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. What has that got to do with <laughs> Chutney? I mean, I mean, you, <laughs> well, I don't want to walk around smelling of vinegar, that's all. But no, no, you how can't much be down on that. Are you making? <laughs> This Make the chutney <laughs> naked, right? <laughs> then the vinegar smell won't go in your clothes. Don't get too close, okay, in case it spits. Don't worry about it. Have a shower afterwards. Then you got chutney for the next six months. Rosie, this is the most gorgeous piece of greenery. Tell us about this recipe. So it's basically a leeks vinaigrette, um, which is quite a, a classic um, French dish and a really lovely way of using up leeks. But... Um, using runner beans as well. So what you do is you poach the leeks um, in simmering water under a cartouche, which is a, a piece of greaseproof paper. I love that word cartouche. cartouche it is sounds a difficult, word. but it's not very really difficult at all. It's just it's just a piece you just, of Yeah, you just of, um, um, cut cut a circle. Paper. Well what I do is cut a square of greaseproof paper and then fold it up into a, a sort of um you know, into a triangle and then cut it into the shape of your pan by cutting the end off and then snip a little the tip off to make a hole so let the steam off and then you put that on top of the leeks and it keeps them in the water and it um, steams them and keeps them nicely poached and then once you've um, poached them until they're tender you take them out with a slotted spoon um, and let them just steam off and then you um, char them on a griddle pan or if you had a barbecue going that would be perfect because that would get some nice smoky flavours in there um, and then you blanch the runner beans until they're nice and tender and then while it's... Do you use your cartouche for no, that as well? I wouldn't no, I wouldn't bother Don't with... Don't need a cartouche No, no, that. with the runner beans into really hot... I've got, got this cartouche ready. I'm it, kind of wanting to use it again. I mean, <laughs> it's really about going into um, sort of bubbling, boiling water with the runner beans um, and to keep them nice and green. And then you toss them into a vinaigrette made with Dijon mustard, um, red wine vinegar... Uh, olive oil, caster sugar, um, and anchovies, and maybe a little pinch of chili because I'm really bad for putting a pinch of chili in most things. Um, and then it's so it's a lovely, a lovely thick, glossy um, vinaigrette which coats over the the warm um, green vegetables, and then some toasted. One of my favourite things, toasted pumpkin seeds, just give a lovely nutty crunch as well. And this would be nice. Um, you were talking about runner beans with nut oils. It would be lovely with a with a um, hazelnut or a um, walnut oil. Fantastic. So that's that's. Rosie Burkett's runner beans and charred leeks with vinaigrette. And Tom, your griddled courgettes. To get good marks on a griddled courgette, is that to get you get the griddle pan uh, like screaming hot? Is nice that and hot. Thing? Like anything you cook on a griddle pan, you've got to get it nice and hot, but not not so hot that it can completely like, just burns them. But uh, And leave them on there for long enough. Don't be tempted to flip them too early. You're allowed just... to have a look. Because mm. if you don't know, look, how do you know whether they're... You go with instinct, feel the force, be like a <laughs> Jedi. That's what you need to be. Courgette Jedi. Courgette Jedi. Because you Jedi. want good, Don't... if you're going to griddle, you want good stripes. Otherwise, why have you bothered? That's the yeah, whole point of griddling, isn't it? The, but the problem with having a look is if you have a look you and it, it moves the position and then you put it back down, you're putting it down in a different Parallel position. lines. Yeah. yeah you yeah. just got to, bit of practice, feel the force, become a courgette Jedi. Well, that recipe is also on the website. So happy cooking. Now, um, chutneys. Now, they're, they're really in at the moment, chutneys. Um, I, I'm not very fond of that boiling vinegar smell through the house, but you have to put up with that, don't you? That's, that's part of making chutney. Yeah, but, I mean, does it always need that much vinegar? Does it always need that much acidity level? Not always, you know, I think. And it's also, the, the, there's so many flavours and layers that you can get through things by putting them... You know, it, it, the sugar content is really important, of course, at the beginning. But then also, there it, it is about the, the the fruit that goes in it, and then the vegetables, and then the you know the way that it cooks out. I mean, I I don't think it's a bad smell. I mean, of all the things that go through the house, 
Yeah. Well, cooking a chutney ain't a well, bad one. When I was a magazine editor, there used to be like chutney week when the kitchen was making mm. chutneys. And they used to drift around the office with a trail of vinegar behind them. And I mean, it didn't matter. No one minded. It was their job. But their entire beings were saturated with vinegar smell for about a week. I believe that if you work in a chip shop, you 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 smell of chips, don't you? And f- f- fish and chips, do you smell They're of fish? They're quite clingy smells aren't they like the frying of the frying of anything yeah or if you say you worked at a garlic factory you smell of garlic wouldn't you you would definitely pick up the garlic smell i think yeah but what has that got to do with chutney (laughs) i mean i mean well i don't want to walk around smelling of vinegar that's all but no no you calm me down on that <laughs> that's someone who works for 48 weeks a year in a chip shop or in a garden fact, is very different than someone who spends an hour and a half making a chutney. Okay. <laughs> I do have to say, by the way, that this Make is the, the chutney <laughs> naked, right? <laughs> then the vinegar smell won't go in your clothes. Don't get too close, okay, in case it spits. Don't worry about it. Have a shower afterwards. Then you got chutney for the next six months. Also, you don't, like Tom said, you don't have to have these boiling vats of vinegar. Like I make a the rhubarb. Well, it's a ketchup, really, rather than a chutney. But I, I make rhubarb ketchup and I roast the rhubarb in the oven with sugar, vinegar, and I foil it. So it's not completely filling the house. Oh, if you do it in the right. oven. So, you, so that saves you doing it naked, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I do, I, do. I mean, I do it naked anyway just because. But. <laughs> um, on that naked note, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you, Tom and Rosie. Please join us next week when we'll be talking about how to make the gooeyest in the middle, crunchiest on the outside brownies. Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food.